All right. So just now we talked about the idea of using multi-stage builds in Docker, right? So in order to um, you know streamline the execution, right? So bring us to a significant reduction from previously nine to twelve megabytes for an image that includes both the build environment and then the runtime environment to an image of you know six a bit more than six megabytes only for the runtime environment. So it's kind of a neat uh, way. So um, I will push the um, repo and also link the repo under our lecture um, um you know our, our lecture reference for for today so you can find it back uh and then just use this as a, as a, as a you know um, an illustration example or whatever else you want to see it as so uh, the service runs by the way i just uh, i brought it up so it uh, does its uh, proper mapping just to prove that it's not just copying stuff into stuff and it's not working it actually runs as well um, but that's not the, the point I want to talk about in the remainder of our time. So the, 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 there are a um, few aspects you want to take in, into account when you uh, develop those um, services. I mean, one of them is you want to think about, uh, of course, minimal footprint in terms of execution. So it's very important when you develop them. Um, one aspect I um, uh, also want to highlight is like try to avoid unnecessary packages. And in my experience, what works well is to develop incrementally, like, you know, Dealing with the fact that Docker build will fail, of course, because it's not complete, but you know, incrementally uh, build up complexity and see uh, where things go uh, sideways. You get you usually get good uh, feedback anyway in the build process because it um, redirects the actual uh, command output to the command line. Like if you do a compile command, you actually get the feedback, the pro, uh, the, the the error um, 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 standard stream is redirected to your command line. You will see the output of go build, for example, which is super helpful because it would be the same as if you were to be running it locally. So just to highlight um, that one. Um, we talked about being specific about, you know, versions of um, base containers. So that's an important aspect. Um, so yeah, so a few things that they are uh, bearing in mind. There, there are some, some gotchas in the slide set that I, that I, um, that I shared already um, there as well. Okay, um, uh, yeah, so, right. So this is basically one side of the medal. And uh, so far we have gotten, um, so, so that's how far we are right now, right? So we have basically a Docker file and we can do this complex build process, but we never talked about uh, more complex setups. And likely you will encounter those, like either in your practice or now in your development in your project. What does complex setup means? Well, when I talk about this, I mean about um, projects consisting of multiple services. So how could you do it? Docker oh, that's a quick answer. Yes, right. <laughs> Docker Compose. You can, of course, do it manually, right, by running Docker five times. But what, what, or let's say you have two services. What is still inconvenient about that, running possibly, you know, the Docker run command two times? You need to manage ports uh, availability. Yeah, number one. Yeah, what else? I mean, you could do it, right? If you're completely independent, you know, you just need to check, okay, do, you know, one is using port 8080, other one 8081. Let's get this right. And let's hope I remember this properly. So again, you're down to writing documentation about it, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you, you, you kind of, and that defeats to some extent the objective of having a really lean kind of startup in a way. Yeah. What's the other challenge that you have? Very good. So uh, the, the point here was made like the dependency or interdependency of services, and specifically the startup order matters. Like if you have, for example, backend front end, yeah, guess what? You better bring up the back end first for the front end, right? So, so those are the two aspects you also need to bear in, in mind. The other aspect that you may need to pass uh, information about the second service to the first service in order to, you know, get the IP in order to access the database, for example. So there's a lot of complexity that suddenly builds up that you would need to do manually in some way or another. And that would also often also mean that you suddenly start thinking about um, the container linkage in terms of the host system, right? So you start, or you actually pass the host IP via port 8081, but why can't you contain it uh, or manage it self-contained? Because fundamentally what Docker offers you, and we haven't talked about this, as um, there is some minuscule reference in the letter slide set, in the, in the slide set that has already posted, um, uh, how Docker manages networking. What it does, in fact, it allows you to have a Docker internal network only that, you know, would allow your 
um, Docker instance to com uh, communicate directly without exposing any of that. So it's a kind of a security feature. So you don't need to necessarily redirect your traffic via the host that, you know, at least the visible, uh, uh, the ports of the host, but actually communicate internally, which is quite neat and nice as well. So you can kind of think about this like a virtual network uh, in inside your um, Docker daemon, uh, the environment there. So it's quite quite, quite nice. Um, so yeah, so there's an alleviation. It's called Docker Compose, and I also go as far as to say, even Docker Compose. I tend, even when I when I um, run services myself, I even tend to use Docker Compose for if I only run one service. And, and I'll tell you in a bit why, um, because that's certain conveniences uh, that are kind of kind of built in. So when we looked at the um, or just to, to give you a bit more of a feel, um, Docker Compose is different from Docker file. So the Docker file is very uh, imperative, right? It says run this, run this, run this, run this, and run command at the end. Hopefully things work. Well, let's assume things work or whatever, right? Uh, Docker Compose is a bit different because it looks more like a from a from a from a from a uh, you know overall system state perspective and is uh, declarative in kind and suggesting okay you know uh, a system consists of multiple services that's how they interlinked. Um, that's the reference where you build or pull the service from, and uh, you know those are the port variables that uh, I expect to be be available. So you'll see that it offers a better documentation, as you hopefully see in a bit, uh, of your entire uh, system setup than the Docker file provides, because that's really just telling you what's happening under the hood, not necessarily what's coming out of it at the end. Um, and um, so complementary to the um, Docker, um, we have Docker Compose with a different uh, command. So it's actually Docker dash Compose. Um, which takes as input a file also with a fixed file name Docker. Well, you can customize it, of course, but it would look for a Docker-compose YAML file for its configuration, similar to Docker files for Docker builds. That's also uh, in our standard file. So they're different in, in, in kind. And you see here YAML. Uh, so it's basically a YAML format. Is everyone or anyone acquainted with this? If not, you'll be in a second. So uh, we'll, we'll briefly um, talk about how that would um, look like so i come back to the comparison so this is an example of a uh, yaml file um or a docker docker compose file very simple one in fact hence perhaps also not simple i don't know you make the call um in any case uh, the idea is uh, quite straightforward i obscured i think on the people remote will see it there's actually a declaration of the version of the docker compose file because they are variable versions um that have slightly different syntactic uh, features and so on so this was a layer of version three of course you will get that slide set anyway um, but what you see here is actually that it explicitly calls out okay what are services and what are volumes here right that we are interested in as part of um you know that composite um service environment and what it then identifies by indentation that's yaml files so they basically follow a bit of like the pythonian spirit of working by you know um, uh, fixed indentation so ensure always readability good for configuration files very readable guaranteed uh, proper layout so you don't have to worry about that one uh, but also a bit painful if you sometimes don't get the spacing right and, and, and so on but what what what's what's as, what's in essence happening here well this actually spins up a wordpress environment and wordpress generally consists of two components again this front end idea right so um, um the, the, the php builds usually uh, and um, the back end, which is generally a MySQL database, or I think it's supposed to already be in the diverse others as well. But the idea is you have services, services identified with a unique identifier, DB, WordPress, you name it, doesn't matter. So you make this name, that's basically a reference to that service. Then um, you suggest where it's sourced from, could be an image. So it says MySQL 5.7. You see already how declarative that goes. It's just, you know, that's the image figure out how to you get it. I'm not telling you how that works, right? So it doesn't say run Docker pull in the background or something. And then it also says, oh, there's volumes. We'll get to that in a bit. But um, there is also a, um, a specification, for example, for the restart policy. In, in passing, uh, at, in the last session, I mentioned restart policies. So the idea is now, how can a Docker daemon do a lot of stuff for you if there's uh, interruptions in system runtime being based on a failure, an intended exit, restart of the system, whatever else. This basically says, okay, this is how this container, this service, is going to be behaving, restart at all times, right? So if the system reboots, bring this thing back up. Don't, please don't ask me any questions. So quite nice for headless operation. And then we have environment. And you see here, uh, not good practice, but we get to that in, in, in a bit as well. Um, environment variables. So you can pass along as well. So this would basically be a key value structure in terms of environment variables, the root password. Here's the password, uh, the database of BIP to database, 
the user and the password. So this is not how you want to pass credentials. I'll talk about this uh, uh, in, now. In the meantime, Docker has um, kind of neat um, extension based on the build kit. There was an in, in, inquiry and discussion we had um, at the end of the last session, and I'll post a reference to how to do it in a modern day Docker. But nevertheless, I just want to highlight the fact that you can pass environment variables because that's a very um, straightforward and useful um, case to do. So this is the DB. Now we have a second service, not the indentation signaling the different services. Um, WordPress, that's the name again, that's user defined. It's not you know, enforced by the system. That's really the name. It's more like a unique identifier for that service. It first of all says it depends on DB. So that solves the dependency problem to some extent. It says uh, anytime spin this one up first, if this doesn't spin up, bad luck, don't even bother spinning up this one, right? The dependency is explicitly declared here. Can also be multiple dependencies. If you had five services, and one depends on four of them, guess what? Those four will need to start first before the fifth actually is started as well. It also says, okay, here's the image, bad practice, don't call it latest, we want to be explicit here, right? So there's, but nevertheless, the syntax is about there. Um, the ports can also be called out explicitly. Note here, it did, didn't bother about the port mapping at all, because here the idea is that the database, of course, exposes on given ports. Which port does MySQL expose on? Correct, right, uh, 306, um, but it's not mentioned here. It doesn't need to be because it's internal to the Docker Compose setup. It's managed within, uh, within Docker, so it's never less accessible uh, from this to this container, but not exposed to the host itself, meaning to anything calling towards the host. But WordPress itself being the front end is exposed here, for instance, at port 8000 on the host, pointing to port 80 within the container, because likely that uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, the service sitting in there uh, listens on port 80, right? So it needs to be that mapping and always restarted. And again, we pass environment variables. You see here that um, that's, that's actually a linkage uh, feature. So it passes environment variables that says, um, what is, you know, um, uh, WordPress DB host? Well, it's DB uh, column 3306. So what does it mean? DB will resolve at runtime into the IP that's associated with the DB service. So you, you resolve this dependency passing problem as well, because you wouldn't know what internal IP, because it actually works based on IP networking internally as well within the Docker network, what IP it actually is. But this is basically just the host name that will be internally assigned to that service. So we, uh, this reference is enough. So you don't need to know about the actual IP that this host, this uh, container will actually get within the Docker network. And then you pass some, you know, um, stuff along and so on. So, um, so those environment variables. So this is the standard layout, and I think that is the level of complexity you want to think about that you probably need to be to some extent dealing with. But you see here that actually this simple file draws together two um, services, right? So uh, both of them building on images. It could also mean that they're sometimes actually building uh, directly. So you point to the build file for the corresponding um, 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 container. So it builds the image first and then actually deploys an instance. Um, but yeah, you know, those are some of the primitives. I'll have linked a um, reference to Docker Compose as well, so you see much, much more, many, many more features that are available. But this is the drop of it. So one aspect I haven't mentioned before just now was the idea of uh, volumes here. So you see the linkage down here. So what's the idea about volumes? I briefly touched up on it last time. Does anyone recall volumes? What was volumes? Is it the same as image? Or different? Please. I was thinking about storage. Yep. You're absolutely spot on. It's really about, sorry, yeah? yeah no That's, it's about storage. It's about if you want to make any, so the idea is that um, containers are in principle short lived. And you should not maintain any expectation that anything that's held within a container survives anything or is persisted in any way, right? So if a container goes down, it's removed, it's gone, right? So if container shut down, um the, the the content held in there should also be considered gone so if you want to store information you have two ways of doing this one is to do it on the host which is not generally clever right because you kind of suddenly make the host part of your environment your runtime environment it shouldn't be because it should be quite different independent of the um host you're running uh, your, your instance of the container on or you devise an idea of con uh, volumes on volumes is a basically a different form of a uh, container that's only for storage. It doesn't execute anything, just holds data, right? So and here, it's just saying here is a volume um, called DB data. And then you see this one here. It says this DB service makes use of volumes, makes reference against by key, this volume, 
And how is this then linked inside the container itself? The container itself has, of course, a file system. And we, well, you would need to know where MySQL stores its data. And guess what? It's happening in Valib MySQL, right? So basically, it maps the entire, um, uh, uh, you know, the, like, like, like payload, well, the actual, set, you know, MySQL data, right? The, 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 the files are literally mapped. They're not kept in this container. They're actually mapped into that volume. So every time that thing is going to be rebuilt, shut down, restart, or whatever else, it always maps onto that path, like the mount command in Linux, uh, like literally the mount command in Linux, um, this path to that volume. And that uh, is persistent. That volume is independent of images. So if you delete an image, you don't delete volumes. Right? So it's a separate element. Well, I'm, I'm talking about how this looks like in a bit. So that's the value of using volumes you want to store information. Note that WordPress doesn't do anything of this, right? So there's no, nothing is persisted there. It's all static information, right? You compile the image, that's it. You run it, you run five times, you will always start, you know, the fresh image if you like, um, but you don't actually persist information. All data is managed here and it's redirected into that volume. So the volume Question. is a separate container? Yes, it's separate from a container, yes. But is it also a container that you can actually pull information from? Or uh, you can link it. Uh, you can also access it, but it's actually not super convenient. So the command for that one is not Docker images or Docker PS or Docker PSA, but actually Docker volume. Uh, Docker volume. So if you just run Docker volume, you can see the volumes in the in the system. So I just did it before, and there seems to be there's one um, volume that is uh, associated with one service. I think it's the NetData one. I, I don't recall right now. Uh, but that's one of the volume basic to persist information. But those are the commands you actually have. You run Docker volume, you can create, inspect, list, um, and uh, remove unused volumes as well. Because the idea is there, you shouldn't lose data, right? So Docker doesn't actually remove those volumes for you. So if you, if you remove images and containers forcefully, it doesn't touch the volumes. Uh, so you need to do that dedicatedly by calling uh, Docker volume prune that really says, okay, hey, or RM for uh, remove. So I really want to delete this volume. So because that was one of the concerns early on that people were, lo were losing a lot of data. So uh, uh, the, the concern was alleviated by saying, no, 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 this is a distinctively different concept just to persist data. And it's, it doesn't execute anything. It's just to hold, it's like, yeah, it's container holding data, nothing else. I think that's a comment. Yeah. yeah storage for 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 an image they can use so that's the idea does that concept make sense so i mean in theory i haven't <laughs> i'm not asking you to say hey you know we solved it but uh, um so that's that's the um idea i just for motivation i'll show you a few other ones just to see the variable nature of them right so that was the example i showed before and, you know, it can also be super simple sometimes, like, like this one here, where we say, okay, hey, you have a web front end, and it depends on two services. So what do we have? We have, again, version three is the indicator of the Docker Compose file version, because that signals the features that are supported. The YAML format is fixed, but the, the, the commands that are in there, they have changed over time. That's why the version matters. Um, but here, for example, we have three services. One is called Web, one is Redis, Redis database. Uh, and the you know, DB, which is Postgres, apparently, so database, right? That's how simple it can be. It basically just says, you know what? Give me, give me an instance of Redis, Postgres. You depend on those, meaning start those first before you start this thing. And for web, I don't have an image to build from from this local file. Expect the Docker file to sit there, so it will know that. We'll run Docker build on this one. So that's how simple it sometimes can be um, as well. A bit more. Uh, here's the data volume linkage. So here's a shared volume between the two services equally possible again the key is the linking key is the data volume here and how is it mapped internally is completely different right one of them is again linked to um, you know a file that's specific to that database um, and the other one is um, linked to a uh, the folder that is related to whatever that service does in there so um, you can use um, volumes for sharing data across services as well it's not just as a one-to-one -one, um, associate as well so yeah please can I refer like to if I have now a new image? How can I refer to an old volume? Um, hang on. What do you mean, new image, old volume? Um, uh, or maybe I'm, I'm not using the right word with the image, but basically now I have like I had a local local container that mm -hmm. run on WordPress and uh, MySQL database, and then I deleted this uh, container. 
now we're creating a new container, but then we'd like to use the old, like the same database that I used, like the same information that in a database that I used before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the clean way would be to export properly the data, the database information, right, and store it in a, like a, a MySQL dump or whatever it could be, and re-import re it, or use the front and actually do it. If you want to do that level, you could. Uh, copy the container as well. I don't think that's best practice at all. Uh, but if I'm exporting it, I will need to use the host to basically. Make, I will need to uh, get the host into this old environment, right? Because I'm exporting to the host, and then from the host, like the container will take the information from the host. Ah, okay. Um, now I was more thinking about doing it from an application specific point of view, right? Using the native import and export features that they that they that they that they provide. Um, I mean, in principle, in principle, I don't see. I mean, again, so the volume is linked to a particular container, right? And in the build process, you could, in principle, um, or you can modify uh, anything in a given container, right? So, and if you map a volume to a particular folder, then the data will necessarily be stored in that volume, right? So you could pull from an existing repo or something like this. Um, but if you were to restore a service, um, uh, the, the idea of, of um, reusing the volume, is that what you're suggesting, right? Yes, um, is in principle possible. I don't think it's recommended. You shouldn't even do that for my, particular for database services in the first place, right? Because you don't, you're not robust against like changing database formats. If, for example, the version of MySQL were to change and so on, so there's always the recommendation, especially for database, to export using MySQL dump. But you just want to reuse the data that analyzes it. Then I wouldn't see a problem just reusing the volume. Again, the volume is not deleted, so it's referenced uniquely as well. So um, it's. Um, I, Perhaps I'm misreading the the um, the question, to be honest. But because uh, now you're referring like volumes to var lib db, and this is yeah. this is something that is in the container, or this is something that is. In I see, I see. Uh, so this is the mapping. I see. It's, this is the the mapping um, to the directory in the container. So if you were to run, let's say you run two Linuxes, that's the one you think about, right? So you run two Linuxes, and they have two different applications installed. One is a database, and one is a web server or something, right? So let's say uh, um, 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 Apache or Nginx, whatever, and they're stored in two different directories. You kind of need to show, okay, I actually only care about this payload data, this data, right? The database data and the web server data, whatever else. And the idea is basically how mapping those locations, right, into the volume, but not caring about anything else. So basically, it says whatever is in the data volume should be visible on the container side under this address, under this path, basically. Right. So it means if, for example, a backup software, whatever that service would be, would pull um, from, um, you know, pull, pull, pull its, its own information, it will pull from this location, which is inadvertently, you know, actually mapped from the volume. So if you weren't doing this, if you weren't doing the mapping, it can still store information inside the container. The problem is, this information would be gone as soon as you shut down the container, right? They don't persist. Um, but if you want to persist information, then you just map the corresponding folder into an external container, which persists, right? Even if those ones go down, this one would survive. Okay, and, and, uh, and this is basically the address of the external component, like the var the backup data is, is, uh, is for the external compo uh, container, not for the existing one. Like if you're running now a Linux, like the, you're running like a Linux environment, yeah. inside of the Linux environments, you probably have var lib, the da -da -da -da, yeah. The volumes, the data volume, are basically referring to something outside of this current container to the volume. Correct. Okay. Correct. It's a pointer. Exactly. Exactly. It's a pointer outside of the container. That's right. Okay. Right. Everything, any operation that's done here is actually done here. Okay. Nice. Actually, I should show my fingers as well so people see what I'm pointing at. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that there's a redirect happening here in both instances. So whatever happens in this directory is actually in fact happening on this thing here. Right. So this way, anytime this backup service, for example, were to read from this again. Upon you know reinstantiating, it would read from the volume. If uh, it writes to it, it also writes to the volume. This volume persists and is independent from the containers, which are short-lived by definition. So volume long-lived, image stable, fixed, um, containers short-lived, um, and uh, should be considered disposable. So if, if container goes down, no, no worries. Let's try it again because you should have either made a backup of the data, or they should be static, or they should live in volumes. 
or they could be mapped to the operating system, but that's actually not doing development. I tend to do it sometimes. The reason is mostly that it's a lot easier to inspect the data locally on the host. So that mapping would be quite straightforward because you wouldn't, um, yeah, basically, instead of saying data volume, you, you, you would map it to a host um, path. Uh, we need to look up the instruction for uh, that again because I don't recall it by heart right now. I can just give you a glimpse on it. Hang on. Just to see, um, because I recently did it. Different project. So, uh, yeah, so you could possibly do it like this. So you just say volumes, but in fact, I'm providing a volume. Um, so here's actually, for example, the specified volume, but actually I'm not using it. I just say, hey, on the host in you know, folder.logs, now logs, uh, it's mapped to folder slash logs on the, on, in the container, basically. So that's one of the ways of um, possibly doing it. Yeah, but in, for production system, you definitely would actually redirect properly into a volume. Um, so yeah, anyway, just a convenience deviation there. Okay, so um, in practice, how, how do we, how do we use it in practice? So what's, what's the value? I mean, on the one hand, we have the coordination of containers. We have the uh, management of um, the, the environment, but the main feature that actually is um, quite useful there is of course the very explicit nature of the entire layout. So here's another service example that requires an essay complexity. The simple service doesn't do much, right? It just uh, spins up and it runs and you can do stuff to it. Uh, and the idea is to just motivate this with one service that requires or has a bit more um, um, functionality embedded in it. And this one is basically a very trivial student web service um, that has been incrementally developed some bit over time. Um, and what it basically offers uh, to do is, um, you know, support the storing of um, student information, let's say, our favorite example, because it's so close to home, isn't it? Um, and that is the kind of information we could possibly, uh, the payload that this service captures is a student name, age, and student ID, so that's uh, kind of standard um, information. And it's, uh, we used it as an example of showcasing uh, the difference between in-memory in databases and um, using external instance for MongoDB, for example, right? So the idea is to have a bit of this flexibility. I'll just run this service locally uh, to, to motivate what's, what's happening um, there a bit more. So initially it checks whether there's a DB host specified, if not use an in-memory database. So it does everything in memory and of course not, doesn't persist. It waits for the port. If no port is provided as usual, Heroku style, it just listens on 8080 and has a set of handlers. It, handlers it redirects to most notably the student handler. Um, let's see if I have Postman here so we can just play with it a bit. So, so that would basically listen on port 8080, and if Postman wants 12, um, then I can show you something. If it doesn't want, then. Um, all right. Send a body here. Here's Postman. So we have a student serving running there. Um, and um, this is the, uh, all right, that's now running locally, of course. So I better adjust the URL. And it's waiting on port 8080, a uh, student endpoint. And a student endpoint consumes something like this. Um, uh, this is the structure, the structure I just showed you. I just sent it, I think that will work. So that's 200 that has worked. So let's have a look at what is actually happening behind the scenes here. A bit so you get a, a somewhat and at least intuitive appeal of what the service does. So we have student DB handler student. So uh, student DB handler student. So those are here, yeah, handler student, there you go. Um, handler student, basically it um, expects a post, for example, decodes the um, you know, information in, into the student structure, again, consisting of name, uh, age student ID as an example. And if there's issues, then sends a bad request response, other uh, than not, that it actually checks whether the student ID, so it checks on student ID exists in a 
uh, a local database, sh shows an error if it exists already, or otherwise simply adds this student to that um, database. So that's the basic idea. The, the, if there was a get um, request, I would prepare the header, um, would extract the ID of the student from the URL. So basically would split the, um, the URL in, in the three parts, would expect the student's part uh, pass to be invoked, and then um, checks whether there's a student ID provided, so appended to the path, and based on this, either replies with all students if none is existing, basically assuming that all students should be returned, or with a specific student as extracted from the from the database. So that's the um, that's the rough idea and underlying it. So the um, database is an abstract concept uh, in this instance. So um, here, global V is student storage. Let's see. Um, the declaration with the Matthew structure. So, and it's uh, basically just the interface um, that we have where we can add students, to initialize it, and retrieve information um, as well. So, if not anything else, it will create an internal map of students and basically, you know, just store the different students, um, count students, ex extract students um, if they uh, exist based on their student ID and um, yeah, so I'm uh, sorry, a, a, an array of students. Yeah, so OK, so that's the internal database. So basically just an array storing student information, retrieving institute uh, um, information if, if um, existing. So alternatively, if you pass the DB host, that was the that's the main point that I want to make is. Um, It actually, uh, instead of using this local database, um, with this in-memory database here, it actually uh, uses the uh, students MongoDB. And this one has the same interface. It allows for initialization, adding students, getting students, getting all students, uh, counting students, so the basic functionality as well. But just the implementation is slightly, um, slightly different. So if we look at the MongoDB structure, this is here. So there's a general struct um, that is basically URL, the name, and collection name. That's the standard initialization that you need to do when you use MongoDB. Very common for NoSQL databases uh, that you say, you know, what's the collection you, or database and uh, you're interested in the URL, of course. Um, and, um, you know, what, what do you need to do in order to initialize um, the database, add students to it? So it's specific to MongoDB. Um, just to perhaps highlight this um, instance. This is how you would insert information using the Mongo driver in Golang. So you basically create a session in the first place. So initialize the session. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Mongo dial. So uh, use the database URL um, and then um, link to a database name, collection, and insert the students if you like. And you can retrieve it afterwards and um, return it as well. There's a count functionality in there. Um, so nothing um, specifically, it should be terribly un. un um, conceptually unfamiliar, even though you will not use it necessarily. But the point I want to make is that we have the service that allows for the differentiation both between, uh, you know, a um, persistence, a persistent version using MongoDB and a non persistent one, which is the in memory database I just showcased to show that the non persistent one actually stores data, we just uh, do a call on on this, it should return the students I just enter. Okay, so far so good. But as soon as I restart, this is basically um, gone. But this service actually serves uh, quite well, despite its simplicity, it uh, serves one purpose quite well, and that's to motivate how we can um, possibly um, uh, dockerize this. So, okay, so first of all, we have the general Docker file in the main directory. Um, that's the one you would know and you um, would have seen. So we basically have a um, from directive that um, indicates the base image we're building off Docker 116 as usual. Uh, we copy the um, folders as relevant into that uh, image, pull it directly from the repo locally. So here's an example how you could do it. Um, build the information and then um, basically copy over the um, builds binary or uh, living now under app command student db. So that's the directory, the work directory that the build has happened in. See here. So it needs to correspond. Um, and copies it into, you know, just under folder app, I just you can do it. You could also do a root directory. It doesn't really matter. I just uh, chose that one for this instance, and then basically run it. So that's a plain standard multi-stage build Docker file, right? So something uh, you should be comfortable with. So now, how does the Docker Compose work? Because uh, as you um, recall, this has the flexibility both, you know, to either work with Docker with ex um, MongoDB instances or without. 
And um, here, the idea is to use uh, Docker Compose for that uh, purpose. So here we have a version three file um, of Doc, um, for Docker Compose. We have services, one of them is the, the web service. And that um, takes a few variables. You saw from the main method, we're expecting two variables primarily. One of them is the DB host. If it exists, it uses that one to resolve the MongoDB instance. So it directly gets the environment variable there. Um, or, and the other one is um, the um, port, of course, the port information as we want. So now we want to dockerize this anything. We don't have an external um, service. So for example, there are um, MLabs and other services that give you um, free MongoDB instances, but we want to host this uh, as part of our environment. Um, so the idea is basically to have a um, separate service here called DB. What does it do? It pulls, bad practice, the latest Mongo image directly, right? So we don't do anything else but that. It actually also maps the data to a volume. So here I call out the volume DB data and says, you know, anything stored into slash data slash DB, right, is redirected into the volume correspondingly. So we, it, we persist the information here. Again, the fact that we have an instance of a Mongo container doesn't mean that it persists data in shutdown, right? We still need to map this to a, to a volume. And you see um, how they are linked via, and that's a feature I hadn't shown you before, uh, the, the network implicitly. So they have to get a dedicated network that only they share for communication, right? That's the idea there um, that you can specify as well in order to isolate uh, possible services even within a Docker Compose file. So you can build a bit of complexity and say, those two services actually live on the same network, but this one doesn't for whatever reason. Perhaps a good way of separating front and back end to some extent, uh, but um, so that would be one um, um, possible pathway. So, and again, uh, coming back to this web service, that is, we signal that depends on the one hand, depends on DB, so spin up DB first. Um, the other aspect, port variable DB host needs to be the IP address of DB, because that's the database service we're going to use, like the MongoDB instance. Um, we actually now not relying on fixed images, but just look into the current directory from where we are running a Docker Compose. There should be a Docker file, run that thing, and map ports. Uh, we want to have port 8080 mapped from the outside to port 8080 on the on the inside. Yeah. So that's that's the basic idea uh, there. So that would be the whole um, basically um, kind of Docker Compose file. So why is this kind of neat and useful? You see how uh, what I like about Docker Compose file, they're incredibly explicit. Uh, when you read this, you understand the whole service, all the links, you know, both to volumes, to external ports, to environment variables, uh, you know, um, um, dependencies, of course, when there are other services involved, if there's only one, okay, that's a challenge. But nevertheless, it's, uh, if you run this, um, if you run a Docker container individually using Docker run, you kind of need to get that information from somewhere somehow, right? It needs to be still some sort of readme that tells you, oh, I'm expecting this environment variable. I'm expecting this part. You wouldn't know otherwise, right? So, but here is kind of super self-contained. The idea is literally to reduce everything to more or less, or to actually more, <laughs> to one command um, only. So let me just exemplify how this how this uh, how this operates. So I just need to pull basically the entire um, service. This now lives in on, on GitHub um, as well. I'll provide the link um, afterwards. Let me get out of this one. We have a clean environment. Yeah, yeah, blind typing. So, um, right, so it puts the whole thing, CV student TV, right, and we basically have the same, sorry, we have the same um, structure that we just said before, uh, all those different subfolders and so on, and the Docker Compose file, we have the modules file from from Go, they're very important. Don't forget those if you copy those into your image for building. If you don't have those, it will not have external dependencies. And then, of course, the Docker file. So the file we are interested now in only, literally, is the um, Docker Compose one. So we just say Docker Compose uh, and uh, up. And I'll just run this directly right now, but we'll see a variant after that. So what's happening under the hood? Um, it actually says, hey, hang on. Uh, first of all, I'm creating a network. We, you said you want a network. Good luck. I'm also creating a volume because it doesn't exist. Then it says, oh, I'm pulling Mongo latest because I don't have Mongo either, right? So it doesn't have that in its image repository yet. 
uh, from which it will build a container. So now it pulls the Mongo um, database environment. Takes a while. But you see how it incrementally sources its own uh, you know, things and kind of sets up the configuration. Uh, OK, so we should have done that in advance. Um, but it's nevertheless uh, good to see it in a way. But also, of course, cached, right? The next call, as long as Mongo latest is not updated, so it's the latest tech, uh, would, of course, not do this pull um, request because um, you would be cached in a um, Docker, local Docker images. So let's see. And then afterwards, it will hopefully do the build. Um, it runs Mongo first because I indicated the dependency. Remember, I said depends on, right? So before anything building is happening, it says, no, 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 you need to get MongoDB going first. Otherwise, don't worry about anything else afterwards. So it, it picks up on this. Uh, and the order and the specification of in the Docker Compose file doesn't matter. Uh, so you can be completely flexible there. So when you with those uh, work with the Docker Compose file, be like super mindful about version, uh, yeah, basically versioning it because uh, you would probably experience issue with um, most of the time you will have some sort of um, formatting violations because YAML is really rigid about the indentation similar to, to Python. So more than content, you would struggle with the, the formatting in, when, you, when you start um, writing it yourself. So be very diligent about um, um, commenting in minor updates to it. So we don't lose that information. So, okay, we got somewhere. It, it, it pulled the image, now it moved on. It says, okay, um, now we're building the Golang image. So same st stages as before. It basically says, uh, you know, make this uh, base image builder, then pull in all the different um, files, copy them in manually. Those are all the folders and the uh, mod files and so on. Uh, change the working directory, perform the compilation and name the output student web. That's the builder image still. And then it, it pulls an external, yeah. So, yeah, this is the Mongo driver, by the way, and that you see being pulled there right now. So, uh, part of the reason why I didn't use Mongo in this course, we, you could, of course, is that it's really um, sensitive to versions of Golang. So, uh, various versions of the driver don't work with other versions of it. Ah, it was a bit of a pain, hence we went for Firebase, but this is duration. Plus, you learn something else anyway, um, which is um, has the same features effectively. The structure for MongoDB internally is very closely related to what you learned about Firebase, right? Having the collections, sub-collections, queries stay in. The interface is slightly different, but the principles are uh, pretty much the same conceptually. So, um, and then it does the, um, the runtime container from scratch, does, uh, you know, setting work directory. Now, later on, hopefully, we'll copy the content. So building has worked, by the way, which is good. Um, now it copies the, the binary, and it registers the execution as well. So once everything is built slash pulled and set up, um, then it should actually um, spin up the instance, instance of all those services in a correct order. So, um, yeah. So here, for example, it complains, hey, hang on, you didn't build the image yet. You know, uh, be aware of this. This is the first time call here. Uh, we now built the image for you. Next time, be more diligent, tell us that you want to build the image. Um, Okay, but it recognizes that it's not built, it does it for you. And then you see how it spins up the individual services. It sets up student DB, DB1 first, and web to, um, one as a second one. Those are the containers you'll see in Docker PS. It names them automatically following the names of the services that you actually devise. So I ran a Docker Compose directly uh, just to showcase the immediate output. I should have run Docker Compose dash D for detach. So I mean, run the service headless and leave me alone. I don't want to see any output. Here, I said I didn't do that. I kept it in the foreground because I want to show you uh, the, the log output from those different services uh, as they're interacting. So you see, most of it is being from, from the, comes from the Mongo uh, instance, DB1, uh, as, as the prefix there. And it signals, you know, uh, um, uh, timeouts and, um, um, you know, the, the, the invocations and so on. Um, so, for example, there's, a, um, I think, four lines up, there's the creation of the collection that has been um, happening. And you see that the web, web one service listens on port 8080. So it's a good way of the kind of debugging um, things a bit um, as, as they occur. So now coming back to that friend here, um, I just need to uh, figure out you know, what's the IP again. Started somewhere. Um, now I need to, of course, use the floating IP of the host that hosts Docker um, on port 8080 because I did the uh, port mapping there. Um, and I can basically just run a get on this one just to see if the service is up. It says, yeah, well, there's nothing in there. Um, so let's see if there was anything. See if I can uh, keep the 
keep this visible so you see a bit of the activity that's happening on the server side um, to see that there's actually some other interaction. So if I run the all right. get again, you see it's actually there's a request happening, right? So it's opening, it uh, creates a uh, connection, tries to retrieve a um, connection, uh, you know, collection, but then actually immediately afterwards close the connection again. That's uh, the, the way to do it in those uh, self-contained functions in, uh, in Golang. But now I'm just going to post something, post request to the same service, and you should see um, that something should have been hopefully posted. I didn't see any output here right now. Let's see if it actually did. Pull info, yeah, it uh, pulled the information, so that's good. Um, and close the information again. It didn't show us the payload, it's a bit of a pity. Okay, if I post the same student again, it should violate because I'm using the same student ID, that's that thing down there. Uh, and it says students exist, so that works. Let's post a different one. Um, do this as well. So now we should have two students in there. I run a get briefly just to signal that it registered both students. Okay, so it did what it's supposed to do in that service. What I'm doing now is shutting it down. Control C. It does a graceful shutdown. You can be a bit more, yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, forceful, but actually it, it does it in the um, correct order as well shuts down the web service first because it depends on the database and afterwards the database. So it does all that kind of coordination, the composition, if you like, for you quite quite nicely. Um, and I just want to bring it down, bring it back to show you that actually uh, it has persisted. Or hopefully it has um, persisted the kind of information that was uh, relevant here. So it takes a bit. So now we see all things are down. So if I run sudo docker ps, you will not see them because they're actually not running. If I run ps-a, you will see that the containers are actually um, also here, they still persist here, you see them. Um, ps-a being all, student.web, you know, has been created three minutes ago, the other one four minutes ago, and you see what images they are built on and based on. So you don't do anything of this, uh, docker compose that, that does that for you. So I spin it back up. Um, D for detach. So basically, spin it up, but don't uh, bind the um, console. So, uh, and now it's a lot faster, you notice, right? So, um, because now the instances should be running. So, again, Docker PS is your way of checking it. And you'll see that both instances are now running with those uh, corresponding names. However, you should now not directly interact with those ones. That's something that should be left to Docker Compose because it manages it. And if I just do a, a query again, you should still see the both instances are actually there because they're now stored in the volume that had been attached to the uh, Docker Compose file uh, associated with um, MongoDB in particular. So, yeah, and we can now also inspect um, the or briefly have a review the volume file as well. sudo docker volume ls should show us um, the volume and it's named uh, as it was prescribed as part of the compose file into student db db data right so that is the volume now um, that holds all the persistence data that everything is linked to so that was the idea about docker compose to motivate this a bit um, admittedly brief but that's the idea does that make sense or are there any questions about this I don't think it's a terribly hard concept, but it takes a bit um, to also have some some linkages uh, to uh, to examples um, there on the website. I'll provide you with slides that, of course, some some additional pointers from the slides as well. But fundamentally, that's the idea, right? So next level up, Docker file, creating individual Docker, um, you know, uh, container images in the first place, running containers from there. One level up, having multiple services, how to compose them effectively and efficiently using Docker Compose. Recommendation for you guys: um, When you start setting up, um, when you start setting up your your project, um, your project repositories quite early, I would think about deployment as equally early. So you probably should even start thinking about, you know, having a Docker file already, how to you know to build in your images, and perhaps if you have multiple services, if you don't, don't bother. But if you have um, uh, use perhaps Docker Compose. In fact, even if you only have one service, I would still consider it because of this very explicit nature. It's literally one command, no parameters involved, right? So always Docker Compose up, 
um, and of course, you know, dash B for detached and um, test it and um, make it part of your testing as well. Like if you change your uh, code base, does it should run basically. So this deployment is sorted from the get go, because then it will just be always like uh, a modification um, 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 of the Docker file, uh, very minuscule. And usually that doesn't change too much over time unless you introduce a new service. The only point is that sometimes if you copy in the files manually, of course, you need to adjust that. But if you do perform go get me in code from a public repo, you won't even need to deal with this. Um, so it's quite a uh, quite neat way of um, automating things. Do it early. Um, I would recommend you to have at least one person who's responsible in your team. I think everyone should understand this, but possibly one person who is dedicated responsible for the deployment side. That means managing Docker uh, and Docker Compose, respectively. Questions? My plural still gets me. Um, not, not so far, it's okay. Um, if there are issues, um, can of course bring them up. I'll post the uh, links to those repos so you can basically just look at the files again. I didn't do it. There's anything in there you can just run them, should be able to run them out of the box. If, if you get into trouble, of course, let me know then. I probably did something wrong. And uh, the Docker shorthands describe how you install Docker on your VM as well. So you should be in the situation to replicate all the examples and take it from there. Um, yes, uh, and alongside the Docker reference, which is really useful. It's linked at the bottom of the Docker shorthands as well, alongside the tutorials. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, see you on Monday. Right. Um, I post the issue if you have questions about the presentation or more comments and so on, just post below, I respond. Um, the question was already, which order do we present in? Guess what? I'll take the IDs, your uh, weird form of incrementing IDs. Um, I'll just, you know, ignore the gaps for them or ask if there are some you know uh, wildcards some some um, placeholders if you liked but that's the idea just representing that rough order i don't see any sense in making it more confusing by randomizing this on top of it thank you very much for your attention thank you.